It's an honour and privilege uh, to be asked to speak uh, at the uh, John Stott London Lecture. Um, you've got a handout, you've got a Bible. Um, we only have an hour and we're going to be going at a, a fair lick. Um, uh, I hope um, this is going to be helpful for you in your evangelism and in your uh, discipleship. So we're going to begin. Welcome uh, to my neighbourhood. So uh, in lockdown one, uh, outside of Oak Hill, about 400 yards uh, to the left of the college, there is a, um, a theatre called the Chicken Shed uh, Theatre Company. And um, in March, I went for my hours uh, exercise and I was walking down there and the, the theatre had been closed for a few days. But as I um, uh, walked past, I saw this and I'm going to share this uh, with you now uh, on uh, the screen. I saw this particular uh, poster, I suppose, put up uh, at the time. Um, Ubuntu, translated simply as humanity or the belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. Chicken Shed will continue to strive to connect all people and all communities. I am because we are. Well, I thought that was very interesting. That wasn't us, the usual kind of come to a jazz evening on Thursday, um, but that's what they wanted to say. Um, as uh, I was just walking along, going for my hours exercise. So I go about another 400 yards and uh, I come to this, which was on the, um, the bus stop outside Cockfosters. Whether you're born here or not, if you know to stand on the right, you are a Londoner. We are not an island, we're home to so much more. HSBC, of course, the bank, together we thrive. Now, I want to uh, say to you tonight that uh, I was preached to twice there. There was, a, there was a double preach that I kind of experienced as I just went for my uh, walk. And what we're going to be looking at tonight is how do we engage, how do we engage with uh, the desires and longings that people have, and how do we uh, do that in a way that connects Jesus uh, to that? And so that's uh, the, the kind of framing for this evening. Now, there's something that I always say right at the beginning when I'm doing a talk like this, um, especially, I suppose, tonight, given everything that's going on in, in the world. The first thing is this, God does not want what I'm going to call grumpy old men and women. You might have seen the TV show a few years ago, uh, grumpy old men and women, celebrities talking to camera about how the world was uh, so much better. Um, Britain was better, dogs were better, pavements were better, kids were better. Um, and it's very easy. And I know, you know, day one of lockdown, uh, global events that are going on at the moment, it's very easy to think, oh, I look back to a kind of through rose tinted glasses to a wonderful time, but God does not want grumpy old men and women. What God does want are the men and women of Issachar. You remember in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, David's calling the tribes to them and he calls the men of Issachar and they're described like this. They knew the times and knew what Israel should do. God does not want grumpy old men and women. He does want men and women of Issachar. Jesus criticized the Pharisees because they knew the weather patterns, but they didn't know the signs of the times. And that's got to be the spirit. Um, Ecclesiastes 7.10, do not say, why were the old days better than these? It's not wise to ask such questions. Today of all days, we need to remember that. That's got to be our frame uh, as we uh, engage the world around us. So we need to know the times. But here's the problem. Who do we have faith in? There are so many analyses. And um, I want to just uh, describe, I suppose, just for a, a, a few minutes as we start, a kind of debate that rages in academic circles that I do think has um, import for us. Which one of the experts do we believe? Which one of the Christian experts do we believe in about the, the Western world, which I'll be addressing tonight normally, uh, um, in which we live? And here I want to juxtapose um, uh, two thinkers. And again, I hope I'm not caricaturing them. I'm more generalizing, but we have to kind of go fairly high level here. Um, in, the, in, in the blue corner, we're gonna have someone called Charles Taylor. And Charles Taylor is a Catholic philosopher 
who wrote an incredibly influential book called A Secular Age a few years ago. And uh, Taylor dis uh, talks about what does set the secular mean? What does it mean to live in a secular society? And Taylor basically says, look, um, now basically it's a 800 page book. So saying basically is uh, kind of slightly facile, but anyway, he says the secular is not simply about there were more people going to church and now there are less people going to church. The secular is not even that there's a sacred secular divide. Rather, being in a secular society is not about what people believe. It's about believability. Let me say that again. It's not about what people believe. It's about believability. It, it's the idea that faith, whatever faith that might be in, it is both contested and contestable. It's the equivalent, this is my illustration, not his, of, um, uh, well, to, I, I could have, I normally use this illustration where I say, if you want to go out to a restaurant, but let's say if I want to get a takeaway tonight and I want to Google uh, which uh, local Indian restaurant has uh, a five-star review, and I'll find about three of them, but I know that all of them will also have a one-star review as well. Who, who, who do I believe? And Taylor has great ways of analyzing this. And he says, in a sense, we've all become very uh, fragilized in our faith, in whatever faith we have. Now, I think there's a, a lot of um, helpfulness in Taylor's analysis. But the one thing I want to focus on tonight is that one of the things that Taylor argues is that in the West, especially since the Reformation, and he, he, I, I disagree with his, uh, his take on the Reformation, but we'll go with him for the time being. He says that as a, as, a, as a culture, we have become basically disenchanted. We've become immune to deep religious experiences, being only in tune with what we might call the worldview of um, what I'm going to call scientism, um, which basically says that the world, that genuine knowledge of reality must be determined by the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology. To put it another way, it's a belief that John Lennon was right when he sang Imagine and he said, above us is only sky. I'm sure you know people who fit that description. And Taylor says, I suppose that, that that's the overarching worldview that's be, been in, in the majority, that's kind of taken over this idea of disenchantment. Charles Taylor in the blue corner. Now, in the red corner, we have a, a, a church historian called Rodney Stark. And uh, Stark is a, a professor of history, at, I think it's Baylor uh, University in, in the States. And um, he takes a slightly different view. Listen to this quotation. Nor has Europe become disenchanted. Multitudes of Europeans believe in ghosts, lucky charms, occult healers, wizards, fortune tellers, hulda folk, and a huge array of other aspects of that enchanted world that Taylor believes has long since vanished. What Taylor really demonstrates is that from nowhere is one's vision of modern times so distorted as from the confines of the faculty lounge. Whoa, meow. This is what these academics get up to in their kind of sparring. And Taylor, what Taylor does, he looks at all kinds of studies that have, uh, that, that have come out, you know, 47% of Americans believe in a guardian angel. And he says, you know, this idea of disenchantment is, is overblown. In fact, it's a myth. We are as enchanted as we've ever been. I'm sure you know people like that as well. Now, which one's right? In the blue corner, Taylor, or in the red corner, uh, corner Stark? Just on Stark's analysis a little bit more, th there is some uh, sense that that can be backed up. There's a huge uh, research project go going on. I think it's finished th this year. It started in 2016. Um, millions of pounds, I think it's 2.9 million pounds given by the Templeton Foundation. And it's called Understanding Unbelief Across Disciplines and Across Cultures. It's based out of the University of Kent, but um, other universities are involved as well. And what it's done is it's looked at um, unbelief in a number of countries across the world, Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, the UK and the USA. And last year it published a kind of, I suppose, interim findings and here are two that I want to uh, focus on. Uh, interim finding number five, 
unbelief in God doesn't necessarily entail unbelief in other supernatural phenomena. Atheists and less so agnostics exhibit lower levels of supernatural belief than do the wider populations. However, only minorities of atheists or agnostics in each of our countries appear to be thoroughgoing naturalists. That is, they believe that nature is all that there is. Or number six, another common supposition, that of the purposeless unbeliever lacking anything to ascribe ultimate meaning to the universe also does not bear scrutiny. While atheists and agnostics are disproportionately likely to affirm that the universe is ultimately meaningless, in five of our countries, it still remains a minority view among unbelievers in all six countries. Now, this was brought home to me uh, a few years ago. It was the day of the Champions League final between uh, Tottenham Hotspur and Liverpool. And at the time, he's no longer a uh, manager, but then uh, Maurizio Pochettino, who was the manager of Spurs, there was an article on him. And uh, Maurizio Pochettino, you imagine, he was the manager of a multi-million pound Premier League club. You think of the millions of pounds of uh, um, science and technology that goes into that business acumen. But in his office, Maurizio Pochettino has a bowl of lemons because he believes that when people come into his office, with negative energy, the lemon, that the negative energy is sucked into the lemons and he changes the lemons every few days. And he's written a lot about this, Pochettino. He's written a book on it. Uh, he's, here's what he says. I believe in energy universal. It is connected. Nothing happens for causality. It's always a consequence of something else. Maybe it's one of the reasons that Harry Kane always scores in derbies. I believe in that energy for me, it exists. Now, what I'm trying to say to you here is that uh, it's quite a complex scene. On the one hand, we know people who have been completely gripped by this idea of naturalism or scientism. They seem very disenchanted. But we also know loads of people who believe in all kinds of stuff. They're more enchanted than ever. Maybe they're not enchanted in the way that uh, we are as Christians or in other what you might call recognized world religions. Maybe they're, uh, you might say, disenchanted, differently enchanted, but they're enchanted nonetheless. Just before we uh, try to explain this theologically, um, here's a really interesting quotation. If you imagine on the one, on the one hand, you've got um, uh, applied uh, science, you've got technology, on the other side, you've got what might be called superstition and magic. Uh, Peter Kreeft is, a, is a, a Christian philosopher, and he said that what I'm about to read to you is the single most illuminating three sentences I've ever read about our civilization. Here we go. It's uh, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man. There is something which unites magic and applied science, i.e. technology, while separating both magic and applied science from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline and virtue. For magic and applied science alike, the problem now is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. The solution is a technique. What Lewis is saying is whether it's through artificial intelligence or whether it's through a magic charm or a bowl of lemons, those two things have a lot more in common with them than they don't. Hold that thought. Now, when we come to God's word, when we come to the Bible, remember as Christians, uh, as evangelical Christians, we are to interpret the world through the word, not the other way around. Um, in God's light, do we see light? As we look at those kinds of analyses, how do we understand in, in the light of God's revelation in scripture? And I think that the Bible is brilliant because it's it's nuanced to say that both of the things that we've been describing already ring true in a certain sense. 
But we need God's light. We need the light of the word to shine on this analysis. Uh, and the Bible is perfectly adequate to do that. In fact, it, it, it's the only way we can see light at all. I want to describe human beings universally uh, in uh, an illustration that I'm going to call the cosmic game of hide and seek. For many people, especially in the West, over the last few hundred years, the idea is, is that if we were in a game of cosmic hide and seek, God is the one who's been hiding. And actually, he's found a really good place to hide because we've looked for him everywhere and we can't find him. Yuri Gagarin, he went up to the, he went up in space, he came back down, allegedly said to the Russian authorities, it's disputed whether he actually did say this now, but he actually said, there's nothing up there. Here's the issue, though, from a biblical point of view. God is not hiding. Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the, the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. God is not the one who is hiding. In, in, in creation, he has uh, made himself manifest so that we are without excuse. Now, notice here um, what God reveals. These invisible qualities, verse 20, his eternal power and divine nature. Now, have you ever thought, why, why is it those invisible qualities? Why not God's holiness or some other attribute of God? Why eternal power and divine nature? Well, I want to suggest that there are two um, uh, implications of God revealing his eternal power and divine nature that are really important for us as created beings. And we're going to come back to this as we go along this evening. I think uh, the idea of eternal power gives the, the impression or gives the sense or reveals that we are created beings who are dependent upon God. I think the idea of dependence, no, dependence, is partly what's being communicated in God's eternal power. God has created in everything that he has made, including ourselves, that we are dependent upon him. Well, what about divine nature? Well, divine, that God is God and we are not. But the idea of nature gives the idea that God is personal. There's a personal relationship. And where there's personal relationship, especially between the creator and the created, is, I think, the idea of accountability. So eternal power is the idea that we are dependent upon God. Divine nature is that we are responsible or accountable to God. Dependence and accountability. Now, lodge that in your brains because we're going to come back to that as we go along. God has revealed himself. He's made manifest that we are dependent upon him and that we are accountable to him. We're made in God's image. And that's especially true. Our very being um, kind of reveals that we're dependent upon God and accountable to him. So we're made to relate to God. We're also made to cultivate the cultural mandate. Genesis 1, 28, to be stewards of the earth, to have dominion, to tend and keep uh, the garden. We're made as human beings to worship God, but also to make a home for ourselves. So God is not hiding. We're made to relate. We're made to cultivate. We are hiding in the cosmic game of hide and seek. Where is the first game of hide and seek? Genesis 3, 9. God says, where are you? Now, being God, he knew where they were. He knew that they were hiding. It's not a, a kind of I don't know where they are. It's a moral question. Where are you? We are the ones who are hiding because as human beings, we know that we, Adam and Eve, were ashamed for what they had done in trying to set themselves up like God. And so because of that, there is a terrible relational breakdown. We, we, we are made to be dependent upon God, 
but in our sin, we think we can be independent. We're, we're made to be accountable to God, but we're going to create God in our own image that we don't have to be accountable to. Now, what do we do? Well, uh, Romans 1, uh, 18 uh, to 32 tells us we take that truth about God that we're dependent and accountable and we suppress it. The people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The idea here is a, is a holding someone's head under the water. We kind of drown the truth. We suppress it or repress it. Now, in, a, in a, my book Plugged In, I give some examples about this. I give the example of um, when you go on holiday and you try and play that great game in the sea uh, where you try and sit on the beach ball in the sea. And you sit on the beach ball and the beach ball pops back up again and you try and sit on it. The whole point is, is that we, 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 we suppress the truth, but it can never stay totally suppressed because then we would have an excuse that we didn't know. And we do know. So God reveals himself. We sit on the beach, but we suppress the truth, but it pops up again. God is constantly revealing himself. The wrath of God is being revealed. The fact that God shows in creation that he's a, a God who gives so much blessing, those wonderful nature psalms about how God is revealing himself. But, but we suppress the truth. Now, how do we do that? Well, God is telling us in creation that um, something is not right. Something's gone wrong. That's the wrath of God revealed now, not just the wrath to come, but the wrath of God being revealed. It's God giving all the blessings that he does. And we should look and say, wow, God, you're an amazing God. And we should be saying, wow, something's gone wrong here. But we give our own interpretation to those things. We take that big, fat, black marker pen and we draw over God's messages. But those things can never be totally suppressed because they're, they're, they're part of our very being. We, as human beings, we're like one of those joke birthday candles that are quite annoying, actually. You try and blow them out and they just come back up again. And you try, you try and semtex them and they still pop up. There, there's a pilot light in us as human beings that is never totally extinguished, however much we try. And as we suppress the truth, the other thing that we do uh, is, is we substitute uh, that kind of uh, that, that vacuum that, well there isn't a vacuum because we substitute where we should be dependent and account accountable to God we replace that with other things this is of course why uh, uh, Romans 1 talks about idolatry sin isn't only doing bad things it's fundamentally making good things into ultimate things sin is building your life and meaning on anything even a very good thing more than God. Whatever we build our lives on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. So there's a movement going on here. As we suppress the truth, we still have to have things that we are dependent and accountable on because it's in, in our very nature. And th so we take created things and we inflate them to be like gods. Idols are found at the level of ultimates ultimate explanations, ultimate authorities, ultimate commitments, ultimate loves in the lives we live, the homes we make for ourselves, our hopes, our fears, the scripts we follow, the, our everyday liturgies, the, the habits that we do every day, the liturgies that form us or deform us. And that's why we can say, and we see it, don't we see it at the moment with everything going on, the public square is a battleground of the gods. And people will always fight for their idols and gods, their objects of worship. And this, I hope, starts to explain why when I go for my 20 minute walk in lockdown, why I see these kinds of posters. It's people uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 suppressing and substituting, but, but, but it's suppressed truth. It's people as God's image bearers together thinking this is what we think about the world. And this is how we can deal with the world. But here's the problem. Isaiah 44 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's the kind of the private eye of uh, uh, the prophets. I mean, if you remember in Isaiah 44, we have this crazy picture of the 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 idolater who um, uh, wants to have their supper, make their dinner and uh, with it. Um, they um, they make their dinner, but with half of the wood, they then uh, prepare, uh, they make a God from it. 
And Isaiah says, this, this, this is ridiculous. They know nothing, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see and their minds closed as they cannot understand. Here's the killer verse, verse 19. No one stops to think. I always say when I'm doing a talk like this or when I'm teaching at Oak Hill, your non-believing, non-Christian friends, I doubt they are with 400 other people tonight doing something about how we connect with culture as an agnostic or an atheist. People are just living their lives. They don't, they don't think about worldview. They don't think about suppressions and substitution. They don't think about those things. They're, they're just getting on with their lives. No one stops to think. And the Bible is very uh, clear that idolatry, as uh, Chris Wright says in his wonderful book, The Mission of God, is radical self-harm. It's also radically, terribly ironic. In trying to be as God, we have ended up less human. The principle affirmed in several places in the Bible is that you become like the object of your worship is very apparent. If you worship that which is not God, you reduce the image of God in yourself. If you worship that which is not even human, you reduce your humanity still further. So, friends, look, here, here's the complexity. And, and it is a it, it is so complex the fact is, and even you know, the greatest theological minds have struggled with this, is that, in a sense, people who do not know the Lord Jesus, unbelievers, non-Christians, they both know God and they do not know him at the same time. Now, what does that look like? Well, it actually looks like Acts 17. Because this is a, a passage that I think really shows us how we see this manifest. And I think Acts 17 is there. I mean, I'm going to the old classic war horse passages, but that's because they're so brilliant, is an exemplar for us 2,000 years later. Remember Paul's attitude as he goes to Athens. I mean, he's not even meant to be in Athens. He's, he's on a stopover waiting for his friends. But what's his attitude as he looks over that city? Um, John Stott's brilliant in, in, in his commentary here. He says the city was literally submerged in idolatry. The only time a city is described in those terms. And Paul has what we would call, he's provoked. I mean, the, the NIV is a little bit kind of, um, or the, the NIV in a, quite an English way says that he was distressed. But literally, he has a paroxysm. He is provoked. He's, he's violently shaken by the city submerged in idolatry. Now, again, what's his attitude? He doesn't say, stuff it, leave them to it. I'm going to go and meet my friends and go off somewhere else. No, he's provoked, but he, then he does what he always does. He goes to the synagogues, he goes to the marketplaces. And here's the interesting thing that people forget about Acts 17, is that he's, he's talking about Jesus and the resurrection. And they come up to him and say, look, we do not understand what you're saying. You're a babbler. Literally, you're a seed picker. You're picking ideas and we don't understand what you're talking about. And so because of that, he's then kind of thrown back to kind of explain himself. He's hauled in front of uh, the, the Areopagus. And remember how that passage starts. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. What does it look like for men and women to know God and not know God at the same time? What does it mean for men and women to be running away from God and running to God at the same time? Paul captures it beautifully in this term I see that you are very religious. The problem here for the interpreter is that this is a word that's only used here. There's no other, there's no other, there's no other kind of example of this word being used. So what does it mean? Does it mean, is Paul affirming the Athenians and giving them a handshake and say, great, you're really religious, that's brilliant. 
I think that's hard given that he's literally been violently ill because of idolatry. And at the end, he's going to call people to repent. It's not a handshake. Is he sneering and cynical and superstitious? Well, I don't think so because he spends time with them. He talks to them. He persuades them. I think Paul here is encapsulating this religious religiosity of human beings that we see today still in the fact that people are both enchanted and disenchanted at the same time. Here's what one writer says. It's not beyond possibility that Paul cleverly chose this term. People of Athens, I see you're very religious. Precisely for the sake of its ambiguity. His readers, that's us, would wonder whether the good or the bad sense was being stressed by Paul and Paul would be striking a double blow. People cannot eradicate a religious impulse within themselves, as the Athenians also demonstrate. And yet this good impulse has been degraded by rebellion against the living and true God, as the Athenians also demonstrate. Although people do not acknowledge it, they are aware of their relation and their accountability to the living and true God who created them. But rather than come to terms with him and his wrath against their sin, they pervert the truth. And in this, they become ignorant and foolish. I like to say that when Paul kind of is making contact with the Athenians, it's not the contact of a handshake. Do you remember handshakes? We used to do it a while ago. Um, it, it, it's the contact of a rugby scrum. He, he's got to start somewhere and he sees that the Athenians have all these hundreds and thousands of gods, but they're still hedging their bets with an unknown god. And Paul has to start somewhere. He's wandered around their, their objects of worship and he says, look, the unknown god is not what I'm about to preach to you, but I'm going to start here. And then he expounds and gets to Jesus. And what's Paul's appeal? Well, it's a call to repentance. Please, uh, please remember, I always note this. This is going off track a little bit. But at the end of Paul's amazing sermon, which is really a kind of a pocket Christian worldview, systematic theology, it's brilliant about who God is um, as opposed to what we think God might be. But um, Paul says at the end, he, uh, God commands all people to repent for he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this by to everyone by raising him from the dead. Uh, my kind of uh, my, my late uh, mentor, I suppose, the former principal of Oak Hill, Mike Hovey, uh, drew, drew my attention to this years ago. Uh, we, we often think, and it's quite right, the resurrection of Christ is, well, it's, it's not about Easter bunnies. Here, the resurrection of Christ isn't even about new life. Here, the resurrection is evidence that God is coming to judge. The resurrection is an evidence of judgment coming. I'm sorry, that's what it says. He has, he has given set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof to this by raising him from the dead. Okay, as we come to the the first kind of uh, end of our first half, I suppose, first section. In the cosmic game of hide and seek, what have we said? We think that God is hiding, but the Bible says God is not hiding. He's revealed himself. We are the ones who are hiding. But here's the great encouragement. God is not hiding. And I, I don't mean this um, facetiously, but God is not a very good hider. I don't know, have you ever played hide and seek with a three-year-old or four-year-old? Terrible, absolutely terrible. You explain the game to them, they go into the room and hide, you come into the room and they're, they're so excited, they burst out and you say, no, the idea is hide and seek, go and hide. And they do it again, they can't contain, contain themselves. In the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, God is jumping up and down saying, here I am. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made himself known. God's not hiding. He's jumping up and down in Jesus saying, here I am. God's not hiding, but he is the best seeker. When I was about three or four, I played hide and seek with my mum and dad. And I found a really great place to hide right at the back of the sofa. And I couldn't really, I couldn't, um, I couldn't think uh, process why 
After five minutes, they were laughing. After 50 minutes, they were crying. Couldn't, and at that point, I wasn't gonna come out because they were so cross. I was not gonna move. And my dad must have knelt down and must have seen a bit of sock because he, let, he stretched out and he pulled me out. The son of man came, came to seek and save the lost. Now, that's all great theological truth. It's all wonderful. What does that mean for us practically? Well, here, and here we get to the kind of, uh, the big thought of the day. And uh, as all, as it, on, ed, on all of these things, I'm, I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants, of Stott and others before. Here, I want to talk about um, one of my favorite missiologists, someone who spent their life thinking about these things. And he's a man called J.H. Bavink. He lived from 1895 to 1964. He was a missionary in Indonesia. He then came and was a lecturer at missiology um, at the Free University of, Am uh, of Amsterdam until his death. And Bavink had spent his life uh, looking at world religions and he knew his Bible well, he knew other religions well. And he says, look, as I go around, there seems to be a kind of framework within which human religions need to operate. They're, they're kind of, they're, they're the similar questions that people ask. He says, you can call them direction signals, but you might call them magnetic points that time and again compel human religious thought. Human beings cannot escape their power, but they must provide an answer to those basic questions. And these magnetic points, I want to argue, are not just true of what we might call world religions. And again, remember, religion is a Western construct, but world religions, it's true of all of us. And what I'm trying to do in my work and my research is say these magnetic points can be applied to your most hardened secular Brit or whoever. These are uh, the magnetic points are, 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 are itches that we constantly scratch and make the, the, the itch worse. Babbing says this, just think about this. If only people could shed their self-awareness, their individuality, their sense of royalty, if only they could simply dissolve into the world around them like plants and animals do without norms or morals, but they cannot. They are human. They exist with the indescribable greatness as well as the pathetic woefulness that that term covers. And what I want to do for the rest uh, of our time now, and again, now this is work I'm, I'm writing up it into a book, which hopefully will come out next year, is to say, what are these magnetic points? Because I think these are a great framework. Um, for those of you who are kind of medically minded, you might call them a kind of a morphology this is how this is the framework by which we understand how humans are, are running away from God and running to God at the same time, how they know and they don't know. And Bavink says that, that there's basically five magnetic points. Let's go through them. Now, these are my my kind of titles that I've kind of adopted. These aren't precisely Bavink's terms, but I thought these might be easier uh, for us to understand. The first is what he calls totality. Is there a way to connect? All human beings have an innate sense of totality, that they're small cogs in a much bigger machine. It's the idea that in some sense, we're cosmically interconnected with creation and with other people. And because of that connection, we, we, we struggle as human beings. On, on the one hand, we think that we're insignificantly small. We're kind of divine uh, small human specks on a on a kind of on the shoe of the world it's that idea when you go swimming in the sea and you just see the expanse and you have that tummy wobble who, who am i i'm nothing but when we do connect with creation or with people around us then we don't feel insignificant we feel amazingly significant because we belong with everything else and all of a sudden we have that kind of enlightenment that we're, we're we are special and we enjoy communal awareness and so as human beings we crave connection and we feel abandoned after we've experienced it and we crave for it again and again now 
lots of other religions have that kind of concept. But what we need to think through as we wander around the objects of worship that we come to is we see this idea of totality. And is there a way to connect? We see it all the time. I was I had I had two examples of it that I started this lecture with. Ubuntu, the idea that we are, you know, I am because we are. I only understand my identity because I understand we're, we're part of one humanity. Or my sense of connectedness of as being a Londoner because I stand on the right on the escalator, but that gives me a sense of worth and identity. In 2012, Facebook, in 2012 this is, Facebook celebrated its one billionth user. Now, look, I know that a lot of young people don't use Facebook anymore, but I'm guessing the demographic of a lecture like this, people will use Facebook. So there you go. 2012, Facebook celebrated its one billionth user. Here's, here's the ad campaign. Listen to this. Chairs. Chairs are made so that people can sit down and take a break. Anyone can sit on a chair. And if the chair is large enough, they can sit down together and tell jokes or make up stories or just listen. Chairs are for people. And that's why chairs are like Facebook. Doors, doorbells, airplanes, bridges. These are things people use to get together so they can open up and connect about ideas and music and other things that people share. Dance floors, basketball, a great nation. A great nation is something people build so they can have a place where they belong. The universe, it's vast and dark and it makes us wonder if we're alone. So maybe the reason we make all of these things is to remind us that we are not. Now, if I was a betting man, I would put my mortgage on the fact that Mark Zuckerberg has never read the, the obscure reform missiologist J.H. Bavinck. But that is totality. What about the recent trend in tracing our family history or the pop or the popular programs like Who Do You Think You Are? It's because we want to know that we're part of something bigger. We want to know that we've got roots. We want to know we belong. What about conspiracy theory enthusiasts? People believe they're part of a much bigger narrative that others can't see because that provides a greater insignificance to think that you have the ability to understand reality. What about Comic-Con or, or Pride Parades or anything where those who feel like outsiders are now joining in? Now, for those participating in those things, there's a real feeling of invulnerability around these sorts of events because you, are no, you know that you're one little person, you're insignificant, but you're surrounded by people on your side. More generally, why, why have we pined over the last few months for um, that when we miss, um, you know, going to the weekly football match or music concerts? We know that there's something we share together in mass movements like this, where emotional openness is openness to the concern of others, which opens us up into moments of ultimate concern. Yes, we can sing in our bedroom with the hairbrush. We can sing on Zoom. But singing in Wembley Stadium with 10,000 others is completely different and elevated experience. Now, what is going on there? What about the avalanche of adverts on TV or public transport for dating agencies? eHarmony, Match.com, Silver Singles, Her. You see, in the above us only sky John Lennon world, romantic relationships often bear the weight that communion with God used to bear. Therefore, no wonder people have a stronger desire to find the one because they want to connect with someone who understands them. It's like the Jerry Maguire film, you know, you complete me. It's now that kind of relationship that's believed to come closest to the communion with the other that people at some subconscious level know they've been created for. Now, I've spent quite a lot of time on totality. I'll zip through the other points now, but you get the idea. Norm, is there a way to live? There's a vague sense that there are rules to be obeyed. People know and accept their moral standards and codes which come from the outside. There's an appreciation of transcendent norms of behavior which are somehow ordered. This brings a sense of responsibility to live up to those norms. Now, you might think, well, Babbing, you're writing 70 years ago. Surely this is dated. 
you're kidding me. We're, we're, as, we're as norm fanatic as we ever were. A friend of mine was in their local coffee shop the other day. A lady walks in pushing a buggy. As she walks up to the counter, she asked, are your straws paper or plastic? Fortunately, the owner said paper, at which the lady said, I'm so glad I can drink here. Now to be low plastic, vegan, socially aware is the new norm that we feel we need to live up and obey to. Now, the, the issue is though, it's not just um, living up to the norm, it's seen to be living up to the norm as well. Now, of course, there might be all kinds of um, our, our kind of environment, um, our very might, and our environmental conscience might be strong. We People want to be good stewards, but it's great if they can see that we want to be good stewards as well. Here's a great example that a student sent, sent to me. This will resonate with uh, lots of you, I hope, in the kind of LICC constituency. Take work appraisal systems. Many secular employers officially praise and provoke, promote innovation and risk-taking and say that they want their employees to be free to be themselves, to express themselves and work in ways that suit them. Each week they are told this is what they are to aspire to. However, every year the appraisal system insists on evaluating each person on a static grid of numerical scores, with, which makes no room for nuances in job descriptions or personality. Everyone must work in exactly the same way in order to get a good score. The appraisal score then determines one's pay for the next 12 months. The practical upshot is that the employees spend the whole year in a state of tension between following the rules of individualism and the rules of the appraisal statistics. What about clothing? A friend of mine was a goth in their youth and part of the appeal was being different to the norm but the other side of it was that everyone was different together in the same way. Now, the goth rules are very different to the rules of the wider culture, but there are norms. For example, I didn't know this, did you? Really well-established goths could wear baby pink because it was ironic, but if you wore it and you didn't have the right credentials, you'd show yourself up as not fitting in. The pleasure comes from not conforming to societal norms, but you still want to conform to the rules of the subculture because we need to fit in somewhere. Norm, is there a way to live? Deliverance, is there a way out? We know that there's something quite not right with the world. There's finitude and brokenness and wrongdoing. The problem of suffering and death consistently confronts us. We mourn for a paradise lost and long for deliverance. Now look, while we note that under the sun, as Ariana Grande sang in a, you know, somewhere over the rainbow after the Manchester bombing, troubles do not melt like lemon drops, uh, it, we kind of recognize that there is something more and we, we long for it, we long for deliverance or we long to look back. I mean, again, C.S. Lewis writes a lot about this in literature, the idea of uh, sensuk, the idea of longing, yearning for happiness, the problem is, well, the problem is the problem. There's all kinds of things that we think we need to be delivered from, and that masks, uh, that kind of creates the solution. If the problem is ignorance, deliverance comes through education. If public health is the issue, then the National Health Service is the savior. If belonging and loss of identity is the problem, then nationalism will bring deliverance. If discrimination is the problem, then justice is the answer, or is that education again? Indeed, for some, that can only be delivered through policing and the rule of law. Perhaps the problem is not out there, but the problem is in here within me. One book that's had a lot of um, uh, people have read is uh, The Chimp Paradox by the psychiatrist Steve Peters, uh, who's transformed the career of many of our sporting heroes. And in this model, the problem is ourselves and the, and the, the, pro the, the kind of the problem is ourselves and the solution is ourselves. Well, you might think this is a bit heavy and uh, people just deliver, people don't think about these things, they just find a way out. But even that ironically is an escape. Um, one can be delivered from deliverance. And a pastor friend of mine said he's currently at the moment discipling two guys who are addicted to the mobile phone game Clash of Clans. These are 30 year old men simply because it's their way to escape. 
their lives. But running away isn't as easy as it sounds. Even in our escape, we're still haunted by the same questions. Um, a few weeks ago, my kids finally made me sit through six hours of Marvel Infinity War and Endgame. Now, you know, you don't have to tell me, I don't have to be the most incisive film critic to know that the desire for deliverance looms large as a recurrent theme. And then there's the problem of death that we long to be delivered from. Even before COVID-19, I know lots of pastors who have had conversations with both Christians and non-Christians for whom sickness and death is their main anxiety point. One person was anxious because his dad and sister had cancer, he might get it as well. Another who had a heart attack and had lost a baby terribly in a miscarriage. Another because she grew up in a family where her sister was in and out of hospital. For these people, dark forces are always at them, convincing them they're going to die. Every cough or lump or pain is dreadful. And increasingly, there's kind of confusion out there. Again, another friend of mine had a conversation with a, another dog walker, a very intelligent guy who recently was struggling to come to terms with the death of a loved one and had dabbled with spiritualist things. When my friend spoke of the hope of the resurrection, this well-read urbanite responded, but how can we know if only someone could come back from the other side to tell us for certain? This is a very intelligent guy. Deliverance, destiny, is there a way we control? Although human beings know themselves to be active players in the world, there's a nagging feeling that they are also passive participants in someone else's world. Babbing has this great phrase, we both think that we lead and undergo our lives at the same time. Uh, now, the example that I've written on this um, uh, since then is uh, this great, this was another student who, who sent this in. They were working in the office and they said this, you must never say the phones are quiet in the office. When, this first, when I first started in the office, I thought this was a bit of a joke, but it's considered deadly serious. You do not say that, the phones are quiet. I've been interested to try to talk to that with some colleagues because they're clear they have no belief in any sort of higher power and they're perfectly rational people. At the same time, saying the phones are quiet will result in something or someone making said phones busy and unbearable. We simultaneously have no control over how our phone shifts are going to go. You'll just have a day like that and are responsible for our own others bad shifts because you said it was quiet and that made it busy. Now, look, here's the interesting thing. I thought this was a one off. This is everywhere. Accident and emergency departments over the police. Uh, my, my son's a, 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 a metropolitan policeman. Um, he says, you do not say the word quiet. You say it's Q tonight. If you say quiet, you will have a busy shift. I've even found peer reviewed journals that have had articles on the Q phenomenon. We did a test on whether saying quiet in A&E made it busy or not. Again, this idea of destiny, to, to know where we've come from, um, the, the idea that there's a, a, the, the, it, are our lives determined or do we have freedom? I mean, think about all the personality tests that are so in vogue or the DNA kit, 23andMe, uh, know your ancestry. I mean, I did that a few years ago. You know, my mum's comes from Scandinavian heritage. My dad was from in, uh, Guy Guyana, Indo-Guyanese. I'm also apparently 1.9 Ashkenazi Jew and 2.9% Nigerian. Now, does, does that determine me? Do I have any freedom outside of that? Finally, a higher power. It's the belief that everywhere we perceive that beyond, beyond all reality stand a greater reality. This is kind of the super magnetic point. It's where all the others converge. And we see this all the time in time that what I'm not going to say people believe in God, but this is this idea of transcendence. Um, my great my the one example that I love here, I saw it on ITV a few years ago. Uh, it's the phenomenon of champing. Have you ever heard of champing? Um, it's uh, church and camping. So the um, lots of churches that haven't got anyone going to them at the moment, they hire out their buildings so people can have a champ in a church. It's camping in a church. But the idea here is that you might get a sense of identity and belonging, or you might get a feeling of transcendence 
being in a place that has historic association. So one very middle class parent, mum, wanted her kids to wake up with um, the light streaming through the stained glass window and the experience that that would give them. Um, and there, there was a great, I mean, this is where all the worlds combine in terms of Christian heritage and superstition. There was a journalist interviewing this woman and the journalist noticed on the church wall that there was a large wooden plaque with the Ten Commandments on. So this, this is how the conversation went. Journalist. So people who come here, you welcome anybody, but they've got to be quite well behaved because they're the Ten Commandments on the wall. Champa. Well, that's an original part of the church. But as Champers, we always ask that people respect the building because it's a consecrated building. Journalist peering at the plaque. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So if people come here for a naughty weekend, it's only with their own wives and husbands. Champa laughing nervously. You can't say that. They both laugh. Now pick the magnetic points out of that. Now here's the thing. All of those magnetic points, totality, norm, deliverance, destiny, higher power, they are all ways in which we, we twist and distort what we saw in Romans 1 about dependence and accountability. It, it's those two truths that God has revealed that we suppress and substitute. There's, there's a link between the magnetic points and the dependence and accountability. And Baving has this great way of how they all dynamically relate to one another. We don't have time to go into that now. Now, hurtling towards a conclusion, six minutes left. What do we do with this kind? I'm saying that everyone manifests these magnetic points. And what we have to do is show how Jesus both confronts those magnetic points and fulfills them at the same time. And here we come to our word of the evening with six minutes to go. And this is a word called elenctics. Now, uh, it literally means it's the science which unmasks sin against God and calls people to a knowledge of the true God. And I'm going to use it because John Stott wrote about it in Christian Mission in the Modern World in his chapter on dialogue. And the idea of elenctics, it's the idea of confronting and unmasking sin and calling people to Christ. It's saying to people, what have you done with me? It's Jesus saying, who do people say that I am? We're to do it in a, in a loving way. We're to do it in a living way. We know that at the end of the day, it's only the Holy Spirit that, that unmasks sin. Here's what John Stott said in Christian Mission in the Modern World. The very concept of elenctics is out of accord with the diffident, tolerant mood of today. But no Christian who accepts the biblical view of the evil of idolatry on the one hand and the finality of Jesus Christ on the other can escape it. Further, only those who see the need for elenctics can also see the need for dialogue and can understand its proper place. Friends, look. In our witness, in our evangelism, in our own discipleship, as we struggle with sin, we need to do two things. Through the magnetic points, we need to show the, the, the appallingness of idolatry and the appealingness of Jesus. We don't just introduce people to a worldview or a philosophy. We introduce people to a person. And in my book, Plugged In, I have a kind of method using Acts 17, how we do that. Enter, explore, expose, evangelize. Here's what Bavink says. The gospel of Christ addresses people and rips open their religious consciousness. People, people want to suppress and push away the gospel in the worst way, just as they've been as just they've repeatedly done with God. But it can happen that God causes their hearts to submit. Then all the engines of resist resistance are switched off and people listen. Then the king of glory makes his entrance. The everlasting doors of the understanding are thrown open. And this is what we call the new birth. Now, we don't have time now, but what, I'm, what I want you to think through, this is your homework, I suppose. I'll give you one example. The answer to the magnetic points that everyone is displaying all the time, friends, the answer is Jesus. But the way that we articulate that has to be a way that kind of connects with the magnetic points where people are experiencing them, I suppose. They're all connected to the one person. 
I'll give you one example. Jesus is the way that we connect. We know we have to tell people in, in loving and gentle ways and not by reading off a script, but in our conversations and knowing people, sporting and music events are fun, but they don't last and people get that. You sing your heart out together at Wembley Stadium as if you're one, a huge connected organism, but then you totally ignore people on the tube on the way home. You know, we can talk about Ubuntu and how we're connected, but we're as fragmented as we've ever been. Loneliness is a massive problem in our society. People have got no time for community, so they wouldn't want it even if they had it. A friend of mine noted they've lived in many flats where they've heard the feet above people upstairs, but who have no, no idea who they are. And what about the search for the one, the perfect romantic relationship? Well, we realize that that person doesn't exist and then we get frustrated. Now, here's, here's the, here are the kind of things that I'd want to be saying to someone like that. I'd want to be saying that if you struggle with, are you significant or insignificant, being made in the image of God means that you're amazingly insignificant and significant. You're not God. You're made in the image of God, but you're made in the image of God. Even that one theological truth completely deals with totality. We're created by God. We're created in God's image. We're created from the earth. No wonder we want a connection with the earth. That's what Adam means. We're created for relationships. We're created with a purpose. But something's gone terribly wrong. We crave for connection, but we're not connected in so many ways. We're disconnected from ourselves. We don't even know who we are. We've lost our identity. We're at war inside our heads and bodies. We're connected with our, we're disconnected with our environment. And all these disconnects with ourselves are part of a bigger disconnection we have with God. But let me offer you Jesus. Jesus is the image of the true God, the second Adam who walked on earth, who proclaimed and ushered another reality, another world, another magnetic kingdom. This kingdom is brought about by an ultimate disconnection and reconnection, Jesus' death and resurrection. It's a connection that can be entered into by turning around and trusting in him. It's a kingdom where we don't dissolve our individuality, but we do die and are born again. It's the ultimate dying and the ultimate rising to eternal life. It's the kingdom where there's communion with God, Father, Son and Spirit. It's a connection that means identity with Jesus and it means community with other people as well. Now, what I want us to be doing, friends, is, is taking all of those magnetic points. Jesus is not only the way we connect. Jesus is the way we live. Jesus is the way out. He offers deliverance. Jesus is the way we control. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. In conclusion, a couple, one more minute, Anthony, then I'll hand back. In um, 1883, Spurgeon preached a sermon called The Marvellous Magnet, and it's uh, um, uh, the text of uh, John, when I'm lifted up, I will draw people to myself. And Spurgeon has this great illustration that, that Jesus is the magnet, but then we are magnetized by him and we are to be the, the kind of mag magnets for others. These magnetic points are true. Jesus is the ultimate magnetic person and we're to be a magnetic people and uh, what i want us to be thinking through uh, from this and i hope this has stimulated you as you go around and you start saying yeah i can see these magnetic points how, how do we stay magnetized ourselves i think part of that is the means of grace every week we come we go out into the world as the scattered church and we're we're demagnetized and we're pulled in all kinds of different directions and we come together uh, every week as the gathered church and we're remagnetized we're, we're we're kind of to be sent out again so that we can uh, show people that jesus is the magnetic person so this is the point in the evening when we have uh, about to 25 minutes or so, maybe maybe a little bit longer, uh, for some questions. Um, many questions have been sent through. Thank you for them. It's unlikely we'll be able to get through them all. So apologies if your particular question doesn't ask, but I, I hope we'll be able to ask a, a representative sample of them. It's great to take advantage of, of Dan's wisdom while we've uh, got him with us. 
So first of all, Dan, there's a lot of thanks uh, coming uh, coming through uh, for what you shared this evening, um, uh, as well as an A and E doctor confirming that the word quiet is essentially a, a swear word in, uh, <laughs> in, in in their workplace. We say the Q word in instead. And um, Dan, just a, probably a, a, a quick information question to begin with. What what's the source of the quotations about understanding belief, that project you mentioned, which is based out of the University of Kent, where, where would people be able to find that? Yeah, so there's, a, um, I think on the handout, there is a, there's a link there. Um, it's okay. researchkent.ac.uk, understanding belief. So the, the, the link's on the handout. Brilliant. And this was in the report, there's interim findings. I mean, it's there's a huge, it's like, as I said, a 2.9 million pound Templeton study that has yeah. finished, is finishing this year. But if you want the interim findings, if you go on that website, click on the report section and you'll see these these uh, this executive summary, which came out last year. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan, I've tried try to put, put these questions in some sort of uh, some sort of order. And there's kind of there's a big question to begin with, which is really about um, just uh, asking how you would define the, the concept of culture. Um, now, obviously, you know, this is Q&A time, so, so we don't have all, all night. <laughs> but, uh, so this, this person is particularly asking, especially in terms of how we see and understand the idea of the, of the collective in the light of what we've, yes. been, we've been talking about this evening. So yes. any, any, any reflections? Well, I mean, on that? The, the, uh, the famous cultural theorist Raymond Williams says that culture is one of the two most difficult words to define in the English yeah. language, probably the other one being religion. So it's a harder thing. I think we, we obviously use culture in all kinds of different ways. We use it in terms of being cultured or civilized. I'm not using it in that sense. Um, uh, everyone has a culture. And I think theologically, I would want to say, as one writer said, that culture is religion externalized. So it, it, it's how we manifest our um, deepest cherished commitments to things in the lives that we live and the things that we do it's a making our home for ourselves and uh, I suppose culture is where I want to say this is how I understand the world and want to make a home for myself do you want to join me and then when lots of people join together that there is a communal sense to it and of course we have cultures and subcultures um, but all cultures I think have a root which is um, uh, kind of ideological or kind of uh, have is, is involved with commitments. And then the fruit of the roots are the things that we, the, the clothes we wear, the decisions we make, our hopes, dreams, fears, aspirations. So I, I mean it in kind of in, the, in that religious sense, which I think goes back to Genesis 2, where um, re, re, remember that uh, God is a speaker and a maker. We are made in God's image. We are speakers and makers. In the ancient Near East, the, uh, the, the icon was put down to, to represent the territory of the God. And I think we're all like that as human beings. And when we're not worshipping God, we're worshipping other things. We display the culture of that God as well. Yeah, thank you. This person does go on to say, uh, to talk about, um, you know, some might argue that there's no such thing as our culture, but a continually developing process that culturing is more of an accurate way of understanding a culture. Concept. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's always and, and it's always a very dynamic thing. I suppose I would say, though, that if the pro the problem is, if, if, if you go too granular, you can only describe culture by describing every single person in, in the world. So there has to be a way of grouping things together as human beings. I mean, again, I'd say the same for religion. But Baving has this great quotation where he says, you know, I need to treat I need, I need to treat every Muslim not you can't just talk about Islam in general you've got to talk to every Muslim but of course you can't you, you know you we have to generalize and categorize or else we just go mad and we couldn't do any teaching so there has to be some trends that we can look at yeah thanks Dan that's great uh Dan you 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 oh, obviously um because you're giving us like a whole module compressed into an hour <laughs> yeah. you get um, to that <laughs> we uh we, we, we hopped, skipped and jumped a little bit over the, the, the five things, Jesus Christ, the way we connect, the way we live, yeah. the way out, way of control, the way the truth yeah. and life and so on. Um, what one person was particularly interested in, in you expanding a little bit more on Jesus as the way of control. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. and also why you chose that particular verse to respond to, to you know, to that point. Yeah. Uh, let me just go to the to that bit. Um, 
what so what 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 verse did i use for that i can't in my hand i haven't got it here it's uh, uh, i'm i'm the good shepherd the good shepherd lay yes, i think yeah i think i would want to in that particular point i would want to get across that um the world is not controlled by malevolent evil impersonal forces or uh, malevolent or impersonal forces but our relationship is one of responsibility but also god's sovereign fatherly care yeah. so it's not the idea that there's a malevolent force making phones ring or not it's that as a christian i know that i have a heavenly father and again i think we're going to be in a situation increasingly where um we are i mean you know all kinds of other worldviews and people from different cultures they they have no t they have no problem with um evil spirits and magic eyes and I don't disbelieve those things. I really believe in those things, but I believe Jesus is supreme over them. And, you know, even to world powers, remember Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. Mm -hmm. And I think what we want to be saying to people is the Christian, you know, the idea of are we free or are we bounded? Do we, are we determined or do we have responsibility? It's a it's a constant philosophical battle that we struggle with every time. The, Christ, the Christian worldview says God is in control and yet we have responsibility. And those two truths are wonderfully liberating. And to say that a lot, the lot is assigned a person is not a dark fate or a cosmic determinism, but it's the unfolding plan of God. And that my relationship with my is with my heavenly father. So I think it's a wonderful way of describing a personal relationship, rather this idea that there's either little spirits who are against me. Mm. Um, now, of course, sorry, just to finish this, Anthony. It, hey, go ahead. As, Christ as Christians, we can very easily go back to thinking in those old ways. We can start thinking mm. God's got it in for me or God isn't in control. And in those ways, we're being pulled against the biblical teaching that says God is, contr is in control and I have responsibility and that God's control means that one day there will be justice. So it's a very theological problem. Um, you, you've got to remember that not unbelieving people are theologians. They've got all kind of, the magnetic points are kind of churning away. And we're saying Jesus is the way to deal with this issue of destiny. So that's they're the kinds of things I'd, I'd want to be saying to that. That's great. Thanks, Dan. Just to, you've mentioned the, the magnetic points there at the uh, at the end. Uh, more so, sort of philosophical type question here. Yeah. Do you think these magnetic points have evolved to become what they are today? Are they more relevant to 21st century life in the West than other times and cultures? Yeah. Or have the same longings been at work in human nature all, all along? Yeah, well, because, because I want to tie them back to Romans 1 especially and the idea of dependence and accountability, I want to say, on the one hand, I think they are universal. On the other hand, they manifest themselves in all kinds of different ways in different cultures and different times. So, um, as I said, Bavink's interest, his, the way that he expounds the magnetic points, all he really deals with is um, what we would call really world religions or, you know, African religion or um, uh, um, he doesn't deal so much with your kind of secular Brit. I though what I, I think they're so they're so great because you do see them all the time in 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 life. So I think they do have a universal applicability. Mm. I think the one thing I didn't mention, I think we need to recognise though, and I think the champing is a great example of this. We cannot forget the influence that Christianity has had in the West, and that whether whether you see that as a turbo boost to the magnetic points or you see it as inoculation. I mean that can go both ways. Some people say it's not a great thing that we have all this Christian influence. And the champing is a great example of that. People wanting religious experiences, secular religious experiences in the church. I mean, it's mucked up, isn't it? But it becomes quite complicated. Um, I mean, Yaroslav Pelikan, the famous church historian said, you know, and again, using a magnet example, if you kind of, if you had a super magnet to pull up all the influence that Jesus has had on, in Western culture, there wouldn't much, there wouldn't much be, there wouldn't be much left. Yeah. So we have to, we do have to factor that in, but yeah. I'm making a plea that they are universal points. And that gives us encouragement because a lot of my non-Christian friends, they've got no time for a lot of this stuff, but I would want to be trying to see where are they manifesting those magnetic points? They know, God, they know, 
and they don't know at the same time. And that gives us great encouragement when we go into a conversation. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks, Dad. I, I'm just imagining people uh, champing in, in in my church building, which is like, you know, your standard 80s. Uh, 80s <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, really no no transcendence uh, there. Well, if, if, you're, if you're obsessed with kind of, you can get transcendence out of the colour beige, you'll be doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so Dan, as you might expect, a number of people have, have raised the issue of, of, of COVID. I'll, I'll kind of, I'll ask all the questions together and then you can, you can do with it what, 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 what you want. Yeah. Uh, but someone saying, any thoughts on how a world experiencing COVID is helped to feel the, the different uh, magnetic points? Yeah. Um, just let me find, uh, find where the other, the other ones are. COVID-19 has created a virtual culture removed from real interactions. Is this the new norm or do we anticipate uh, what will be a new, a new normal? Um, I think there was another one, but it's just escaped my eye just at the moment. But, but just speak into the whole, yeah. whole magnetic point, Stan, and the, yeah, the, I the think... situation we find out. Oh, what magnetic point, Stan? Do you think that the pandemic has specifically revealed? So a number of questions there related to, to COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you go through the magnetic points, you can kind of all of them, again, how kind of enhanced by COVID or you can see how they, they apply. I mean, the idea of belonging or being together in connection. I mean, the fact is, I mean, that's manifesting itself in all kinds of ways. But we know I think there is something about not being able to be together as much as we have been bodily or you know people call it skin hunger but the idea of touch and physicality if that brings it home um it, it you know it it is not the same watching west ham on tv than being at the stadium and you know what's going on there um again that c.s lewis quote in terms of the technology and the magic i mean the, again i know there's been lots written on this but the idea that we can defeat the disease or boris johnson talk again the the science um which is still kind of the definitive article even though i think in the press conference today he did admit that scientists have different views on things but that you know that 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 idea i think the um i mean the destiny things in, in interested because i do think people do feel they feel trapped and they feel there's um you know how do i get out of this is there is there deliverance but what's the deliverance you know is 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 has there become an idolatry of life that says well as long as it doesn't matter about the quality of life but the quantity of life becomes everything and these are some of the discussions that, that we're having aren't we in terms of quality and quantity um so i think in some ways you could put the you can put covid and everything we're experiencing through the grid of the magnetic points i mean the norm one incredible i mean even today having to pick up my kids from school and just, I always forget when I go in to put the mask on and knowing that, you know, people looking around me and that kind of, um, that kind of norm being, you know, all of, all of that. I, so I, I think that the, the magnetic points are really helpful yeah. for just trying to think through um, our kind of COVID world. So I think they're great. And again, what they give is a, is a framework yeah. to see where people are really um, interacting and of course, the fear, the fear, the fear of death. I mean, it is a, um, yeah. I I do think there's a paradox. I I realise, and I've, I've I've heard this from anecdotally from a lot of church pastors who've been doing even like door to door stuff when we weren't in lockdown, and people being open to talking more about religious things. On the other hand, the COVID for me has displayed from the top level down one the ignorance about what people think religion is, what Christianity is about. And two, just the imminent nature of it all, that um, everything is squashed um, and, you know, the, the preservation of life, bare life becomes everything. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. We'll move on, Dan, to, to questions of a more kind of practical um, yeah. na na nature now. So someone's asking, even if we can identify the magnetic points in the lives of those around us, how, how can we speak Jesus into a culture which essentially cancels and shut down any any opinions it, it doesn't like so the whole issue around the the cancel culture and conversation yeah, yeah. being shut down when christianity is is is, is mentioned yeah i th i think i mean it, what what we're trying to do here is uh, gently 
um, pick away when when my students write an essay and sometimes they've made a good point but they haven't made it all well I, I uh, made it very well I said you use a scalpel not a machete so we're very good at macheteing what we need to have have is the is the skill of us of a surgeon to be able to just in a very gentle way just ask questions listen I mean we're not very good at doing that remember that the, the, the people who we're kind of wanting to speak the gospel to, that they have their own kind of um, their own religious beliefs that displayed through the magnetic points. Now, I don't suggest we, we I mean, there's nothing worse than you saying to an atheist or agnostic, but you have faith. I mean, that doesn't. Yeah. But they people have commitments. Mm. And I think if you can tease out people's fears and hopes and dreams and then gently what we're trying to do is just, you know, get people to stop and think like in the Isaiah passage. And just gently pick away and look for chinks in the armor because again the encouragement here is if romans one is true then people people know god they're suppressing the truth and they're running to him at the same time and i, I do think with that framework it gives us an opportunity and then you don't have to think well when's this person going to uh, when's this person going to ask a question about jesus when, when are they going to ask me that they feel under the wrath of God? They don't. They're never going to ask you that question. But they're living religiously every day. And that's why Paul wanders around the objects of worship. He has to start somewhere. So in, in the way that we ask questions, again, it's so important that we know. And I, I mean, I say this to myself every day and I'm, it's, it's knowing non-Christians well enough that they'll trust you and talk to you even about the deepest things. And again, in British culture, that's sometimes very difficult. It takes a long time. But long relationships where people people make all kinds of objections to Christianity, but the, the objections are not really the objections that they say. There's other stuff going on that you have to excavate. So I think just again, the magnetic points are meant to be an encouragement to say, here's where you can start and just, you know, just start there and then use, I suppose, in, in the plugged in book use the kind of enter explore expose evangelize not in a kind of a scripted way but just get used to kind of thinking through thinking theologically and then asking questions and then when you get the opportunity well what do you think about you know do you believe that there's a higher power do you believe that we're kind of not free um, do you believe that we can be delivered why aren't you scared of death um, we have a great opportunity using the magnetic points to answer how jesus is the answer yeah, yeah, thanks. Right, so similar sorts of, um, you know, I mean, to, to some extent, you've already addressed this, Dan, but you might want to say some more. Someone's asking here, I appreciate that the idols people substitute for God are individual to each person, and we can best identify them from the place of true relationship. But can you please share some questions or statements you found productive when talking to non-believers in the hope of prompting them to think about their idols and how Jesus may be the the best fit in their life. So any common springboard? Yeah, so I mean, again, I mean, here's, here's an obvious e example, but you can, um, uh, and again, uh, there's an example I've used before. So I was talking to someone who, who was coming out of um, heroin addiction hmm. uh, and they, they were at a church event and they said to me something like, um, I could never become a Christian because I wouldn't want Jesus to tell me what to do. And I said, in a, I said, I hope I said it in a gracious way. I said, what you mean that heroin hasn't been telling you what to do for 20 years? And he, he'd never, he'd never realized that he was, someone else was his master. And, you know, it's the Bob Dylan thing, you know, you've got to serve someone. I think getting people to see that we follow, we, we do follow, we follow, um, um, particular ways of thinking we 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 think that we are all individuals and that we don't follow scripts but we're following scripts all the time even the even the rebellious script is a script you, it comes from somewhere and i think understanding that we we do have commitments to things we 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 are all under authority in some way we we but the but often people think that it's only christians who have to obey someone else um but we're all obeying up things all the time. And it's showing, well, which is, who, who would you rather be mastered by in that sense? Yeah. Um, and, that, and, and that's one way of doing it. I think if you can get to the, the level playing field where people realize we all have ultimate commitments to things, we all follow particular things, um, uh, then I think it's a great opportunity then to show why Jesus is the person to run to and not the, um, the futility or the brokenness of 
um, the, the, the empty way of life. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, what to um, sort of broaden, broaden things out a bit now, Dan, just to think about the role of the church in this. A number of the questions are about the role of the church. Um, yes. uh, so someone, someone's asking, I wonder if you could impact how as Christians, uh, we need to maintain our magnetism. And you, you yeah. mentioned that, that earlier. So is this person saying, surely this needs to be based on ongoing sound teaching from the church leadership. Uh, but our church is equipping us enough. Now, yeah. now, of course, we might we might <laughs> we might disagree on that. But 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 how how as yeah. churches, Dan, you, you know, yeah. in your own context as a, a, yeah. a as an elder, what but, what can we do in our church? I do think so. The first thing to say is that d despite all of our imperfections and the way that we muck it up all the time, the church is meant to be the the closest thing we have before Jesus comes again, it's the show home of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, people laugh when I say that because they think you haven't been to my church, but that's how we are described. I mean, we are, we, 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 we are that nation. We are the holy people. And we, we, the church is meant to be an amazingly magnetic force that shows totality that shows so remember totality is not just communion with god individualistically pietistically it's saying it, it it's saying the people of god is is the most amazing community where you experience totality yeah. salvation is not simply um life um, um insurance that you're not going to go to hell jesus says the christian life is hard you're to take up your cross and follow me but then in a couple of chapters later in mark he says Anyone who has done that will receive now um, mothers and fathers and husbands and homes. And that's got to be the church and in and in the life to, and in the world to come eternal life. It's blessings now in the church. So the church is is the answer. Now, that means that um, people who are rootless and homeless and you know looking for identity and they look in the church and they just see people being horrible to each other and moralistic and backbiting and fighting. We've got a lot to answer for. Anyway, point one. Point two. Yes, the, the church is, as I've described it in the past, it, it's a kind of a medical field tent. Um, I've chosen to stay at Oak Hill for so long because I want to train everyone, but I want to train pastors that every week you've got people who are coming in and they're battered, they're bruised, they're demagnetized, and they need to be fed up, fed up with the word, they, and, and the means of grace, they need to experience fellowship, they need to be remagnetized. they need to be reorientated, um, face true north, and then they need to be sent out again to be magnets in the world. And, you know, that's why one of my frustrations, I do think, this is my own personal opinion, Anthony, that virtual church is virtual, and that the importance of gathering together physically is so important it's how I, I, because i think that's how we've been made i think we're missing something but the, the big point here is we come together we're remagnetized and then we're sent out to be magnetic forces in the world and attracting other people to christ so the church has such a a a, a, a central role in the whole magnetic um in in the magnetic kingdom and i think we need to remember that and where we don't have those means of grace, where we're not being remagnetized, um, you know, no one likes, I mean, there's nothing worse than a rubbish fridge magnet that can't hold a piece of paper. It's so dispiriting. And just how many of us are in our Christian lives, we just, we're just pretty limp, aren't we? And we need that. Where is that magnetism? You know, Paul was provoked by the idolatry he saw, but then he engaged. And I just look over London where I live and I think, you know, I'm not as zealous as I should be for God's glory. And how am I going to deal with that? And we need to do that together as God's people. But the magnetic power that the church has is, is incredible. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, kind of related to that, as a people of diversity, is there a way we can embrace Jesus' culture without hurting one another? You, you, you kind of... Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, going back to that initial um, Ubuntu thing um, and, you know, we, uh, I am because we are and sh surely the global church, and this is where, you know, the, we, we, sh we have a, we can show diversity and inclusion like no other community in the world. Um, that's what the church is. And that's why 
um, the, 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 the diversity of God. That, and going back to the culture question, it's why I believe, you know, there is no one Christian culture. I believe that there is a Christian culture in the sense of living under God's norms, God's blueprint. But the, the, the God that we worship, one and three, the triune God, that's manifest in so many wonderful cultures and in so many different ways. And, 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 and you know, I just, I just think about our church fellowship lunches at East Finchley and the amount of food that comes from all kinds. And you wouldn't put these things normally together, but it's, it's the kind of the, the variety. And that, that's incredible um, uh, witness and testimony. It's not always straightforward because sometimes we think things are Christian, sometimes we think they're cultural, we can't understand the difference. But the, the, the church really is God's new community. And um, that's why it's so important, you know, the work of LICC and Langham and all of these organisations that are trying to understand the, the church from a global perspective. And, and then we can see each other's blind spots and we can deal with that. I mean, that's where the COVID thing's interesting. I mean, I'd love there to be a Christian global convention where we can talk about how Christians have dealt with COVID in different ways in Christian communities, because we could be learning so much from each other there. Mm, yeah. Final question, Dan. Yeah. Um, do you think demonstrating the magnetism of, of Jesus uh, is the job of every Christian on an individual level, or is it just something that the church does as a collective, or is it something in, in between? Oh, no. Well, I think I think it well, it's not in between. I think it's both. And there you go. I think, of course, all of us are. I think we are. Um, we have our own walk with the Lord. We are magnetized um, and we do that together as a body. But, yeah, I, I think what I'm saying is we're all witnesses and we all um, um, are to be ambassadors for Christ. We're all um, God's uh, image bearers and we're all to be magnets. And I think uh, um, I think people have certain giftings and responsibilities and callings. So again, you know, um, I, I am teaching, I hope people at Oak Hill, that they can lead other people to be better magnets. Um, uh, but we, we all have a responsibility in, in the calling that God has given us. I mean, remember, you know, I, I want there to be such a, a strong understanding of Christian work and vocation. You know, God, as Luther said, you know, God the, the, the milkmaid is God's mask to milk the cow. We are God's masks and we are in the calling, the giftings that God has given us. We need to be as magnetic as we can be in ev everything that we've done. And if, yeah. we, if, if we were doing that, if we were as Christians in the UK, especially if we were individually magnetized and as churches, we were magnetized, we'd, we, we'd have so much more transforming power than I think we often do. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. And all that remains to me to say is thanks again for your, your presence with us and may you continue to know the, the peace and the protecting presence of the Lord in these times. Let's conclude our evening in, in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for all that you have done in Christ for us and for our world and for all that you then call us as your people to be in and for the world. Lord, we pause to thank you again for the life and ministry of John Stott, for his careful handling of your word, for his faithful modelling of it in his life, for his unstinting encouragement to others to be salt and light in the world for your own glory. We thank you for Dan, for his presence with us this evening, for his energy. And we pray, Lord, your blessing on him and his family and on Oak Hill, on his teaching and his, his writing and the other activities with which he's involved. Lord, for all of us, we ask that by your grace and through the power of your spirit, you would equip us for those places in which we find ourselves as your masks doing your work in the world and that through those we might draw others to Christ who has first drawn us to him and as we conclude this evening may we be encouraged at what you might be pleased to do through us in this land in this world at this time Lord, we pray not just for ourselves, we pray for all your people, that you'll enable us to be those who point others to Christ, the Lord of all. And we ask it in his name. Amen.